we want to talk about sequences. Now, if you hear the word sequence, you often think of maybe like one after another, like a sequence of events, like the sequence of events that led you to learn calculus. Wow, what a wonderful sequence of events. But when we talk about sequences here, we really want to think of like a list of numbers. So there's like uh, the first number on the list, the second number, and so forth and so on. And in particular, we're going to be focusing on infinite sequences. So these are lists which just keep going and going and going. Now when you say, oh, a sequence is a list of numbers, what else is there to say? Well, not really that much, right? It's just, that's what it is. The real question, and where we're going to put most of our energy, is saying, hey, what's happening at the end? Because you oftentimes want to say, well, what's the last number? But if there's an infinite list of numbers, I can't walk to the end and say, oh, here it is. There's, there's the last one. Because there's not a last one. So what do we mean? How do we figure out what to say is at the end? And uh, what are some tools? That's what we want to talk about today. So let's begin. As we said, a sequence is going to be an usually infinite list of numbers, and they're indexed. And when we talk about being indexed, it just means there's a subscript here. So we don't have to start at any particular value. We can start anywhere we want. So the kth one, the k plus first, the k plus second, and so forth, and so on. And uh, the dot, 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 whenever you see dot, 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 it just means, and it continues. And usually, when we say it, we say there's some pattern here. So there's something that's describing our pattern, and we just say it keeps going. One of the ways we oftentimes think of these sequences are as functions. We say, okay, we're thinking of them where we input the index in, and what comes out is the number that's at that point. So if we put in a five, it says, okay, here's the fifth term in our sequence. If we put in a hundred, Okay, here's the hundredth term in our sequence. But of course, we can also do the opposite. Say, well, here's a function, and that can define the sequence. So if I plug 5 in, that produces the fifth term. If I put 100 in, that produces the hundredth term. So we'll oftentimes think of sequences in this way, as, as there being some function which helps define them. So we can think of describing it as, okay, there's some function which depends on our input, and our input ranges from some starting value k up to some ending value, usually infinity. So if you see this notation, you should think of it as, okay, I'm making a list, starting at k and going to infinity, and everything on my list follows this rule. You, know, you give me a value for n, that tells me what I should see. That's what I have. Well, what's the big question? The real big question are, is saying, what happens at the end? Well, what's happening way down there as we head off to infinity? The tail. Well, you'll hear that phrase a lot. The tail. Well, we can't pick up our last value. It's just there's not a last one. But maybe we can ask the question, what should the last value be? Whenever you start to hear a question which is phrased with a should, well, that really is a limit question. And so we say, okay, well, how do limits work? Well, the idea is we look at what's happening nearby. And I say, okay, so I just pick a number close to infinity, like three, right? Well, three doesn't feel close to infinity, but in all honesty, three is as close as any other number. So what do we mean by being close? Well, when we think of infinity, if you think of the word infinity, you can think of it as being what? Well, it really has two pieces. You can think of it as not and finite. So it's not finite, or a better way to think of it is unbounded. So when we talk about going to infinity, it means we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what we mean when we talk about going to infinity. So close to infinity just says sufficiently large values. So now we're ready to talk about the formal definition of limits. Don't get too nervous. We're not going to use the formal definition very much, but 
just for the record, it's there if we ever need to refer to it. So <clears throat> our sequence A sub n converges to L as n tends to infinity. In other words, the limit as n goes to infinity of A sub n is L if for all epsilon greater than zero, there's some, some big number n which depends on epsilon, so that if we're sufficiently large, so this is that big number n which depends on epsilon says, how far do you have to go? Like how far down do you have to go? If we say, okay, from here on out. So if I have an n epsilon, it says, okay, from this point on, the first part, eh, doesn't work, but from this point on ever after, we're always close to L within epsilon. That's the conclusion. Now you might notice that, wait a second, I thought limits had epsilons and deltas. Where's the delta? And the answer is, this is sort of acting as the delta. So when we think about delta, delta is a measurement of closeness. So we're close to something. So here, our closeness is being close to infinity, and we're doing that by saying, oh, you're sufficiently far away. It is possible that there is no such L. You can come up with sequences that do that. In fact, it's it's pretty simple to do things like, for example, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, and so forth. That's a very simple sequence to describe. And what happens? Well, you just keep jumping. 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, do, 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 do. The problem is, what do I get close to? Well, do I get close to 1? Well, half the time, yeah, but half the time, I get close to minus 1. And the thing is, there's a gap. And I can't be simultaneously close at the same time. So this is an example of something which doesn't converge. Now you might say, well, well wait, maybe I, I converge to zero. No, 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 no. Not, not in our class. That's not how we think of things. There are people who sort of say, well, what if that? What does it mean to do that? But no, no. We, if we converge, we have to converge to one number. One and only one behavior. Now, there's other things that can happen. For example, you could have uh, 1, minus 2, 3, minus 4, 5, minus 6, and so forth and so on. So where you change the sign at every stage, but you also get bigger. So you're going, doom, 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 you know, and you're wildly going back and forth. Okay, forget it. Hopeless, hopeless. Not going to happen. All right, so the question, of course, where do things converge? That's what we're after. And we've already said it, but look, it says it here again. Focus on the tail. Don't be enticed by the first couple of terms. It's easy to create sequences where the first few terms are just so, so tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny numbers. They're basically like specks of dust. They're so small, you couldn't even see them if you pulled out your microscope. And even for the first million, billion, you know, trillion, however many terms. We, we can make sequences which are just like, wow, look at that, so tiny. But we're not interested in the start. It's the end, down there, way down there, like way, way down there. That's what we're interested in. So don't be tempted by what happens at the start. Focus on what happens at the end. That's the real question, so pay attention. So what are some basic properties? Well, we have the same properties of limits that we always have. These should feel familiar. These should be like, wow, aren't these the properties of limits we had before? And the answer is, yes, it's exactly the properties of limits that we had before. And things which, you know, seem intuitively obvious turn out to be true. Sometimes though, intuitively obvious does not mean easy to prove. Uh, things such as, hey, if the limit of one sequence goes to A, the limit of the other sequence goes to B, and if I add the two sequences together, producing a new sequence, well, that goes to A plus B. If I scale a sequence, then that goes to the scaled value wherever it goes to. If I multiply, then that goes to the product. And I can even divide as long as what I'm dividing by is not zero. Now, if what I am dividing by is zero, well, more work, more work. And then, of course, we can start to talk about the squeezing. Okay, what is that? Well, it says, look, suppose you have some sequences, and you have three of them, A, N, B, N, 
and CN. And BN is in between, sandwiched between AN and CN. And as you head off to infinity, A sub N gets close to L, because that's what the limit is. C sub N gets close to L. So you're saying, look, A sub N is getting close to L in some way, and, and then C sub N is getting close to L in some way. What's true? Well, the thing in the middle also has to get close to L. Okay, so uh, true, the same principles. No big surprises. Great, we love it when there's no big surprises. It makes it easier for us to figure out what's going on. Now, suppose we have a function f of x, and we're thinking of it as a function defined for all numbers. And let's say it's a nice function, differentiable, and we look and say, we can create a, a sequence by looking at the function at integer values. Our conclusion says, hey, if the function as a continuous function goes to L, then the place where we look at the integer values also goes to L. And we're like, great, wow, isn't that trivial? Wait, why, why isn't this completely obvious? Why do we need to actually say this kind of thing out loud? There is some subtlety here, and I, I want to make sure that we understand the distinction. So when we write the limit as x goes to infinity f of x equals l, we're in what we would call the continuous setting. And that is, look, we have all the points. We're not skipping anything. So we take all the values along the way. So when you talk about the continuous, that's the continuum when we think of the continuum as the line. Well, what about the other part? Well, when we're talking about this limit, as n goes to infinity of a sub n equaling l, that's in the discrete setting. And here, it says, look, we're not looking at every single value. We're sampling at the integers. So what happens at 3, at 4, at 5, at 6, and so forth and so on? Now, where's the difference between them? Well, the thing is, whenever you, you sample, you're sort of losing the behavior of what's in between. And so there's a, a well, okay, so how can we think of it in terms of a picture? Well, we might have a curve. And so as a function, it could be doing some rather unusual things, going up and down, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. But when we start to sample, we are only are looking at the curve at certain points. And so it might seem a little bit less erratic. And all of a sudden, our, our function says, wow, sample, it's looking pretty good. But the function, ah, in between, it's all sorts of craziness goes on. So there are subtleties. So be careful. Don't take things for granted. But when our functions are nice, and we say, OK, they're behaving nicely between the points, so we can talk about the limits, then we say, great, we can use our continuous tools. What's an example of a continuous tool? Well, one of our favorite examples is uh, Le Hopital. Now, of course, why do we like Le Hopital? Because we can do things like go, oh, Le Hopital. Oh. Well, yeah, that's a lot of fun to do that. But it's also a wonderful way to handle various things like, like limits. And uh, now we can use this to look at some basic sequences. So the following, these aren't just random. All of these are important as we go forward. So let's take a few minutes and talk about them. So limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of n. The claim is that's 1. Well, what's going on? Another way to write the nth root of n is this is really n to the power 1 over n. And what's that doing? Well, it's going to infinity to the 0. And infinity to the 0 is more work. More work. OK, well, for a second, let's, uh, let's just call our limit l. 
So we say, okay, our limit is L. Well, now what? We want to bring that exponent down because we can't really handle something to the something, but we could do fine with products. So we could say, look, the log of L, and now we can pass log through limits because log is a continuous function. Limits can come in and out of continuous functions. That's the nice thing about continuous functions. That's our limit as n goes to infinity. And when I take the log here, that's going to become log of n over n. Well, that goes to infinity over infinity. Great. Do le hôpital, le hôpital, mon ami. That goes to the limit as n goes to infinity. And now I'm thinking of n as the variable, thinking here as the continuous, so I can take things like derivatives, 1 over n to the 1, which goes to 0. Oh, great. So the log of our limit is 0. And therefore, aha, it is, as we claimed, 1. All right, how about x to the n? Well, x to the n, it depends on the size of x. Because what does x to the n mean? It means that at every stage, we multiply. So it gets bigger and bigger and bigger if our x is large. On the other hand, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller if our x is small. And the important one is, if the size of x is less than 1, so the absolute value is really, think of it as size, if our size is small and we raise it to a large power, it goes to 0. It goes to 0. All right, good. Now, how about this one? 1 plus x over n to the power n. The claim is, it's e to the x. doesn't matter what your choice is for x, you could choose x equals 1, x equals minus 1, x equals 100. It goes to e to the x. How do you do it? Same procedure here. Say, so look, take the log, because it's going to uh, 1 to the infinity. All right, well, what is that? More work. That's what 1 to the infinity is. So if you take a log, and uh, that's, uh, we'll call this L, Again, for limit, we can say, look, the log of L is, and it's the limit, as n goes to infinity, we bring this way down. So it would come down in front, and we're going to push it all the way downstairs. So 1 over n, natural log of 1 plus x over n. Now, taking la hopital. This one, pay attention. n is going to infinity. So we're going to think of n as the variable. x is just some constant. So that's treated like a number. So you always want to keep track. What am I taking derivative with respect to? What do I treat like a number? What do I treat like a variable? So this becomes the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x over n times minus x over n squared. That's the derivative of the top with respect to n. And negative 1 over n squared. That's the derivative of the bottom with respect to n. And then we're like, whoa, this is nice. The negatives cancel, the n squareds cancel, the x over n goes to 0, and so our answer is x. That's the log of our limit is x, and therefore our limit is e to the x. In some sense, you can actually say this is how e to the x is defined. e to the x is defined to be this limit, and then you can explore, well, what does that tell you? about the behavior of, of e to the x. Now, the next one, really a very important idea. What's the limit, as n goes to infinity, of x to the n over n factorial? Now, it might help to remember what n factorial is, because we look at it and we say, oh, it's n, you know, because there's an exclamation mark, right? When you see n factorial, what that stands for is it just says start multiplying at n and you keep multiplying all the way till you get down to 1. So that's what n factorial represents. So the claim is if you look at x to the power of n divided by n factorial and then you let n get bigger, that's going to be getting smaller and smaller. You might say, okay, well that's not too surprising, but this is for any x. You could choose x equals a million. 
a million to the n. That's huge, gigantic numbers. And n factorial, sure, they're numbers, but are they big? Really? Are they? Well, the answer is yeah, if you let it go for a while. I mean, sure, small numbers, 5 factorial, it's 120, not that impressive. But then you get, you know, 8 factorial is 40,000, plus a little bit more. And that's, okay, that's a big step up. And uh, so it grows quickly. So what's the argument? So here's, I'm going to do a little, a little bit of hand-waving argument here, but enough that we can get a flavor and say, okay, how do we think of x to the n over n factorial? If you think of what n factorial is, what do we see? Well, you, you have your n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, dot, 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 down to 1. So you have n terms downstairs. Upstairs, you have an x times an x, thing, dot, 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 times x. You have x term, sorry, you have n terms upstairs. So we can think of x to the n over n factorial as x over n, x over n minus 1, x over n minus 2, and so forth and so on, down to eventually where you get x over 3, x over 2, and x over 1. All right, so that's how we can think of it. Now, we're going to let n get big. And here's the key idea. Notice that the top, the x, it's always x, but the bottom gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So the key here is an observation that says, look, there's this sort of dividing line where if I look at all terms over here, x over n is small. It's less than a half. So you might say, well, well when does that happen? Well, that really says whenever n is larger than 2x. So whenever n is larger than 2x, I'm going to look at those terms on one side, and I have, on the other hand, I have these terms over here. Now, the key thing about these terms over here is it's fixed. So as n gets large, from the dividing line and above, that's going to, you know, there's going to be more and more terms added on this left-hand side. Over here, it's a fixed value. Nothing's changing. If I have a fixed number, then I keep multiplying it half times half times half times half times half. And more and more halves, what's going to happen? Well, a fixed number, and you keep multiplying it by half, it's going to go to zero, as n goes to infinity. Because, again, fixed quantity times a bunch of a halves. And when I say a bunch, as many as I need. So it's going to drive it down to be small. So that's, that's the idea. So there's an important moral here. That says factorials grow fast. In fact, they grow faster than exponentials. Now, one of the things that's going to be very helpful as you go forward is to sort of get an intuition. What's the relative rate at which things grow? In other words, if I want to compare different types of objects and say, well, does this grow faster or slower? So we'll talk about some really very small, simple hierarchy. So. Here we go. If you look at a constant, so I'll use c for a constant, that's going to be much smaller than, so I'm using two less than signs to say, in the long run, it's very small compared to. So that's what you should think of when you see this notation. That's very small compared to natural log. Natural log will always be the constant, but it might take a while to get past that constant if it's a big constant. On the other hand, natural log is pretty slow. That's less than n to any power you want. And as long as, well, n to any positive power. So n to the point 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 eventually beats natural log. It'll, it'll always happen that way. On the other hand, n to any power, well, that's polynomial. That always loses out to exponential. So here I should say c is greater than 1. Here, this is c is greater than 0. Uh, I probably shouldn't use the same symbol. OK, I'm switching up. This is now a d. All right. So polynomials lose to exponentials. Exponentials, we just said, they lose to factorials. So 
when you're doing a comparison, just remember, polynomials lose to exponentials, exponentials lose to factorials, uh, logs really slow, but at least they're bigger than constants. So, all right, we'll, from time to time, point out and say, hey, it's nice to know which things are growing faster. Now, one last small idea. And this is monotonic sequences. Now, when you think of monotonic, you might say, okay, what does that mean? Well, mono means one, and tonic is a type of drink. So this is something that requires one drink to understand. No, 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 that's not what monotonic means. Monotonic just means one type of behavior. And in particular, we can talk about things like increasing and decreasing. So if we're talking monotonically increasing, the picture says when you look at your terms, they only go in one direction. So here's like the AK, then the next term, AK plus one, and then the next term, AK plus two. Now they might be spaced further apart, they might be spaced closer together, but they're always sort of going in one way. So that's monotonic. And that's increasing if you go one way, decreasing if you go the other way. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. There's this nice result that says, if you are monotonic, so you have one type of behavior, and you're bounded. So what does that say? Well, to say that you're bounded says, look, you don't go past the third threshold. This is your bound. This is a, you cannot go past here. So you can go up, but you can't go past. You can get as close as you want. You may not even get close to it. I'm, we're not even claiming it's the, the ideal bound, that it's the best bound. It's just saying there's some bound where it says, look, you'll never get past that point. Then what's the conclusion? The conclusion is there has to be some place where you converge. So there's some point, a limit point that you converge. Now, why is this amazing? Well, this is amazing because it says, wait a second, you may not know what it converges to. Because our conclusion is just, it converges. We're not making any claim that says, oh, it converges to this value. We just say, we know it converges to something. So it's this wonderful idea of mathematics that we say, hey, we know something happens. And I say, oh, fantastic, what is it? We, we don't know what it actually is. <laughs> we just know it happens. And it, it's, it's a, a fun idea. We won't make much use of that, but I just want to say that there does exist this tool. And if you want to know more about it, keep going, take more classes. Last thing to mention for today is you will from time to time see something which are called recursive sequences. Now, some people are fairly familiar with a really special case known as the Fibonacci numbers. And if you see that, this will be sort of a proof by, or rather, excuse me, a definition by example. So the Fibonacci numbers say what? Add the two previous numbers to get our next number. So when we talk about recursive sequences, it just really says, oh, if I want to know what my current value is, look at the values that came before and use them in some way. So it sort of builds on things in some nice iterative process. A lot of natural uh, problems are recursive. It says, hey, if I want to understand what the current thing is, I should look at the previous terms because that informs my current behavior. It also shows up in certain applications when you get to say differential equations one of the ways that we can solve problems are we can look at uh, what we call series solutions. We'll, we'll talk about that later on. But hey, it builds off of this notion of uh, saying, look, what's the next term? I can figure it out by saying, what's the previous terms? And so, all right, so that's what recursive is. And we'll do some examples. And in general, examples are good. So the moral for today we have sequences, they're long lists of numbers. We really care about what's happening way down there, way down at the end. So let's go and figure out what's happening down in the tail. All right, see you soon.